Go ahead, Houston. A NORAD reports a Russian satellite has incurred a missile strike. The impact has created a cloud of debris orbiting at 20,000 miles per hour. Current debris orbit does not overlap with your trajectory. We'll keep you posted on any developments. Copy that, Houston. Should we, should we be worried? No, let's let the boys down there worry for us. There we go, a clip from the highly anticipated Gravity, and I'm delighted now to be joined by its co-writer and director, Alfonso Cuaron. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, I want to start off with the quote from James Cameron, which is, uh, the best space film ever. I mean, that's pretty good to get James Cameron saying that, isn't it? And I notice also he's, he's thanked, isn't he, in the end credits. Yeah. So did you know him and, and, and collaborate with him on uh, you know, when you were thinking about the movie? Yeah, I mean, early on when uh, everything seemed impossible because we have tried the conventional technologies and it didn't work, and we were trying to explore new technologies and nothing was making sense, uh, I met with him, I know him through the years, and, and, and he was very encouraging. He says, you're going to make it. It's, it's going to, you, you'll have just to adapt your own tools and, and maybe create some te technologies, but you're going you, you, you're to make this happen. And he loved the screenplay. He loved, we had some animations then. And uh, uh, so, yeah, he was very encouraging like that. But also, he opened the door for filmmakers to be fearless about, about using the digital media uh, as a storytelling story device. You know, so uh, I think that a lot of films, Gravity, would be unthinkable without all the work that he, he keeps on pi pioneering. You know, it's, uh, or the life of Pi would be impossible to think without that. Now, when people come out of the movie, I think the first thing they're going to say is, how did they do that? Now, that's obviously not an easy qu uh, question for you to answer, but I'm wondering if there were certain key technical breakthroughs, like you mentioned, that were entirely necessary to make the film and that, that totally helped you with the making of the film? Well, it was a combination of different technologies and tools. Uh, what they have mostly in common is that everything was pre-programmed, meaning that we have to create a whole animation, very precise animation with very precise lighting in order to inform then later computers and, and, and robots. We use robots. They, we adapted these robots that they use to, to build cars. Yeah. Uh, for cameras and lights. We use LED lights and, and we create our own set of rigs, you know, special rigs and wire rigs, uh, very sophisticated computerized rigs. And we use uh, puppeteers, the puppeteers who did the, the workhorse uh, on, on stage. They were helping us with uh, uh, trying to create this illusion of zero gravity. And in the way that you said certain things um, in this film couldn't have been done if it hadn't been for the pioneering work that James Cameron had done or Life of Pi, from now on other filmmakers in the future will say we couldn't have done our movie uh, without what had happened with Gravity. You know, I mean, some of the things that you've done in this film will become industry standard, do you think? Yeah, but what upsets me is that it took me four and a half years and I'm sure that somebody's going to figure out in the next couple of months how to do it in six months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the only annoying thing. <laughs> and now I, uh, people are going to see this film in 3D and they'll be able to see it in IMAX and with, with Dolby Atmos as well. Some amazing, it's amazing, amazing Dolby sound. Atmos, yeah. um, but obviously not everyone will see it like that. Um, does that, I mean, does that upset you that not, ev not everyone is going to have that fully immersive experience? It upsets me not. I mean, I, I think that, you know, in, in, in their home systems, the film is going to play really well. Um, it's not going to play as, I I as immersively as it plays on, on a big screen and with an amazing sound system and like a huge screen, a screen like IMAX or stuff like that. And also the 3D, the 3D aspect, I think, is, is, uh, is really important in gravity. So you can see in 2D, and I'm sure people are going to enjoy it. And, but look, it's the, it's the nature of things. People are going to see probably, more people are going to see uh, gravity in their iPhone than in, 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 on big screen, you know? So it's just the nature of things. One of the first things that you hear in the film is a bit of um, discussion between between the station and, and, and Houston. And um, I actually thought it was someone in the cinema. I thought it was someone that, like their phone was on or something so chatting away because it sounded like it was next to me. I mean, the, the, the sound is absolutely incredible. Yeah, no, the, the, uh, that was, uh, 
uh, that's thanks also to, to uh, uh, Glenn Fremantle, our uh, sound designer. He also designs Danny Boyle's films. Um, and uh, we did uh, this thing in which we took the surround of the, of the room, surround these, all the speakers around your room, yeah. in a very almost literal way. You know, it's and that's supposed to be uh, uh, against the rules <laughs> because they say that the, the conventional wisdom t tells you that if you start putting sounds and, me and voices in the surround, it's distracting for people because people keep on turning back. And, my, and my, my theory is that people, yes, they will turn back maybe once or twice and then they'll get it. Yeah, that was me. That's exactly what happened. And then you get immersed in, you start just getting immersed in this whole thing. It, when we were doing it and the story, I remember this more old school mixer. He was, he came and said that, that that's wrong. It's not going to work. And, uh, and, and, and my answer is that, look, if after two or three times, say four or five times, you keep on turning and you keep on turning all during the film, that person is the person that at the end of the film is going to go to the screen and look behind to see if he can look at the actors. <laughs> you know? So I don't worry so much about that. Uh, is it possible to go back to a time before the production of the film, before you even wrote the script, when you can remember when you first had the idea, just that sort of germ of an idea of, of the movie? Well, the thing is, it, it, it happened four and a half years ago when I was with Jonas Cuaron, my co-writer. Your son? My son. And uh, we were discussing the possibility. He has shown me one screenplay that he, he, he had written and he wanted notes. I read, said, I don't have that many, that many notes, but I want you to help me to write something like this. And that screenplay is, 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 is called Desierto and he's, he's in pre-production now. He's going to direct that one. And because it, it was this idea of doing some story was very linear, very simple as a storyline, uh, but it was very suspenseful and tense. And at the same time, it was, it was juggling with something very emotional, uh, but without cutting to the chase, not cutting to the emotions. Everything was interweaved. Yeah. And, uh, and throughout the journey, it was a lot of metaphorical themes that w a lot of things that will will be conveyed metaphorical visuals. So it says, I want to do something that, that, like that. And very, very soon we just decided, okay, let's do it in space. And the first image we had, it was just this, this astronaut rolling and, you know, rolling into the void. And, and that was it. I mean, because we immediately discussed the amazing metaphorical possibilities of space. You know, you have a, one character that is drifting into the void, you know, uh, getting farther away from human connections and communications. It's a character who lives in her own bubble and is victim of her own inertias. You know, if I tell you about that character, it could be a character that lives in London or, or lives uh, or, or any place or is in space, you know? So uh, from that point on, we start like exploring the themes that we were going to play with. And we decided that the, the biggest thing was adversities and the possible outcome of those adversities as a rebirth. And rebirth meaning a new knowledge. You know? And so that, that was the point of departure. And then once we were clear about the themes, we just start crafting the adventure. When you're at that stage and you're writing the script, is it important that you're not thinking so much, how am I going to do this technically? You just want to get the story on the page? Well, when you're writing, it's pure bliss because you don't have the, the stupid director and the stupid producer <laughs> around. You know, it's, uh, yes, it's just pure bliss. You're just making believe and anything, and can, happen. anything can happen. And, and you actually, and, and the writer in me kept on telling Jonas, oh, wow, and I think this can be done, but very simply and, and, and very quickly. Actually, when I finished writing, still being the writer, I sent it to Emmanuel Lubezki, the, the director of photography, and I said, hey, let's do this. I always collaborate with him. He's my most, most important collaborator, probably. I so said, let's do this. Um, it's a simple story, one, two characters, you know, like a uh, very sparse environment, and uh, we can do it in one year. It took us four and a half years, but uh, because that was the, the writer thinking. And then the bore of the director and the bore of the producer <laughs> arrive in the same body and start like 
like like popping the bubble of yeah. happiness. And obviously, a lot of the dialogue is is very scientific. These are scientists in space. When did that layer come into the script, or was that there immediately? Did you know what to, oh, to write? Oh no. We, well, we have a, a layer uh, first, a, a draft, and then we immediately we seek advice and, and consultancy from smart people, and uh, and they show and that they just prove us how unsmart we were, and so we did a new pass uh, of the script, trying to to be more scientifically accurate and to start adapting dialogues. So it's about talking with people and giving, you know, telling us expression. And then that second draft that we did was so long and full of technical lingo and full of scientific explanations and justifications of why, why the, 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 the ISS and the Hubble telescope, they are in the same orbital plane. And it was a whole explanation that actually, uh, according to all these people, that that's something that should be done. And in our theory was, okay, something that happened, uh, th that's what they, are, what they are doing. They're putting the, the, the telescope in, the, in, a new, in, new, in, in a new orbital plane. And uh, it was such a bore. It was long <laughs> and boring, and we decided, okay, you know what? Uh, this is a movie we're going to use as uh, we're going to be as scientifically accurate and you're going to use as all the, 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 the technological lingo, but only in the frame of our fiction. And that was, then we cleaned that, that draft and is the movie that you saw. And which I loved for many reasons, but you know, I loved the fact that it was, it was 90 minutes. I mean, this, is, this sounds like a much longer version that you originally so, so, had. So you're saying that it's good it was 90 minutes because it was unbearable? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying it's good that it's 90 minutes because I've seen so many two and a half hour films that it's good that we just get a film that's to the point, you know, and that's one of the things well, that- Well, that's, that's why we, I mean, from the get go, and that was Cornas, it says it has to be short, and it has to be to the point. Yeah. Uh, we have two models in mind. One was um, Duel by Spielberg, yeah. and the other one, uh, Dead Man Escapes by Bresson. Yeah. And says, okay, those films are both under 90 minutes, and, and they, they tell a very simple linear story, and, you know, and the moment that the goal is achieved, you don't go into epilogues or more explanation, you know, it's, uh, and, and uh, yeah, that's what we try to do. Uh, am I right that, that Sandra Bullock doesn't even like flying. She's terrified of flying. She's already had two accidents. Oh. You know, it's like, what are the odds that you have a plane crash and now have two? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and survive them. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And tell me about then what she had to go through to, 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 to play um, the character because, um, you know, obviously we see her and she's in space, but what was it actually like in the studio and what was she going through in the studio? Well, she is, is, is really remarkable what she did because she, she um, worked out and, and practiced and rehearsed for five months before prior to shooting. And uh, because when she was performing, it was a very abstract experience. She was just surrounded by all this technology. Uh, uh, our cinematographer referred that as if she's performing inside an iPad. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, it's surrounded by this technology insulated in these very physically demanding rigs uh, in which everything was pre-programmed, meaning that all the choreographies, all the cues, all the timings were preset. So she had to be very precise about where to move in the every specific moment, almost by the second. You know, so it was more like if she practiced these very a very complex choreography, very long and complex choreography, um, a, to, to the beat, as if it's a dancer doing that. So yeah. when we were rolling cameras, it's as if the dancer was performing finally, and, uh, and everything was just performance and expression. But in order to, to achieve that, it's not only the precision of the choreography, but also the physical training that goes with it. And it's exactly what Sandra went through. All in Shepparton. Uh, yes, all in Shepparton. Uh, we did a couple of uh, uh, a couple of things in Pinewood, but yeah, it's, it's a film that is pretty much a British film. You know, it's uh, all the t all the all the people except the actors and maybe the Mexican director. It's, it's <laughs> everybody else, uh, David Heyman, the producer, 
uh, who also produced the Harry Potter films, and the amazing wizard that is Tim Weaver, the visual effects supervisor, who, who is the guy who's giving us this amazing sense of reality in space. Uh, he has done many, you know, he's done Harry Potter films and, and, and uh, the latest Chris Nolan Batman films and stuff. Spaces in Shepperton. There we go. It's Spaces official. in Shepperton. Yeah. You wouldn't. You, you wouldn't. You, you'll never tell. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much.